Good morning. Before we begin, I'm going to ask Chuck Davis to come up. He's got a quick announcement to make that you want to hear about. Good morning. Uh, good to see everyone. Um, first of all, let me begin. Um, I'm going to take about one minute. I wasn't going to mention this, but I've had three people come up to me uh, in the early service wanting to know how our little grandson Bo did with his surgery two weeks ago. Well, most people don't know, but the surgery was actually postponed until the end of uh, uh, August because they flew in two little children uh, for their heart surgery the day before little Bo was supposed to have his surgery, and they said they would just be overwhelmed. So it's still all good, but I appreciate all the prayers, and many of you have come up to us and told us you were praying. Uh, you know, we got back from Uganda um, the end of the first week in July, had a great trip. Most of you know about it. We had 17 from the church go. Um, it was an incredible week. Um, we just saw the Lord's blessings uh, daily. And uh, so I just wanted to give you a little reminder. You probably saw it in first things. You'll see it in the bulletin today. On August the 16th in Jackson Hall, uh, for the 6 o'clock service, we're going to have about a one-hour to one-hour and 15-minute presentation of the entire Uganda trip. And it will start off with about a 15 to 20-minute video from highlights from the patients we saw during the week and some of the encounters we had. Uh, and then three four team members will get up and speak for about five to ten minutes each. Reverend Sean Henderson will get up. Uh, Victoria Andes will, will, will speak. Uh, Jameson Barnes, one of our interns, will speak. And my wife, Kathy, will talk a little bit about the eye exams they did. And then we'll end up with Tom Ryan giving about a 15-minute presentation on the current state of the seminary, uh, the African Reformation Theological Seminary in Uganda. And we had some good conversations with Dave Eby, who is the director, and looking at ways that maybe our church may become more involved in the next years with some things that they're wanting to try to accomplish. So August the 16th, hope you can come. It'll be in Jackson Hall. Thank you. Okay, if the uh, deacons will come forward, uh, just to remind you, the offering in Sunday school is for local missions. <clears throat> well, this is our last uh, summer lecture in the uh, Ordo Salutis, the Order of Salvation. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been really phenomenal. Um, and we've been so fortunate to have uh, uh, just such gifted speakers come and, and present these glorious truths to us. And uh, this morning we have Dr. Dave Garner who is going to uh, speak with us about glorification. And uh, I don't know a lot about what he's gonna say, but it sounds wonderful. <laughs> and I'm eager to hear what you, uh, what you have for us. Um, <clears throat> Dave received his PhD from Westminster Theological Seminary and has served in theological education, pastoral ministry, missions, and parachurch ministries since 1986. <clears throat> from 2003 to 2007, he served as director for TE3. Anybody know what that stands for? Raise your hand. Okay. I'll read it to you. Theological Education for Eastern Europe, a regional theological training ministry based in Sofia, Bulgaria. Since 2007, he has taught systematic theology and missiology at Westminster Theological Seminary. And while at Westminster, he also served as pastor of teaching at Proclamation Presbyterian Church in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. I know of two books that he's written, and they're on the book cart, wherever that is, it may be in the back. Um, Did God Really Say, Affirming the Truthfulness and Trustworthiness of Scripture, and Sons in the Sun, The Riches and Reach of Adoption in Christ. Dave, welcome. Come and open us with prayer, if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Let's all pray together as we start. The scope and breadth 
The height, the depth of your love for us, O oh God, is well beyond our comprehension. We thank you that you are ours and we are yours. Thank you for your word that discloses to us features of our blessed inheritance in Christ. And oh God, this morning, I pray that you would encourage these, your people, with the glorious truths of glorification. Thank you for these moments. Guide us and direct our steps, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Just one personal note before I start, I um, want to thank you all as a congregation. My, my wife is actually here in the front row with us this morning, but our youngest daughter actually lives here in Columbia, is a member here at First Pres, and you all have been just a wonderful blessing to her and thereby to us. And so when you send your baby off to college, um, nothing more need be said. So thank you. Um, this morning we are surveying what the Bible teaches us about glorification. Let me begin this way. Here's a definition. See if you can recognize what this is. A symbolic depiction emphasizing relationships between elements of some space, such as objects, regions, or themes, end quote. I like to put it a little differently. It's a piece of paper with lines of various colors, words and numbers on it. For those of you who are like me, who live in the GPS age, it's called a map. You remember those? Some of you may still have in your glove box a map. Might wanna clean it out. Some of you may remember those long-term trips with the big maps known as the Atlas stuffed in between your seat and the console. Some of you may have been cutting edge and you had the AAA triptych. Remember those? But in this GPS age in which we live, we really, in fact, the younger generation, some of them have never used a map. Some of you use your map, sorry, your GPS every day just to get from your house to work. Some of you use it to get from your bed to your bathroom in the morning. The GPS has really, in some ways, I would argue, rerouted our brains to where we don't think as carefully as we ought about where we are and where we're going. One of the features of a map is that it actually shows you your location and then puts it in the context of where you're going. And in some ways, what we are doing this morning as we think of the destination of glorification, we are gonna see a road map that leads to a mind-blowing reality of where all of the people of God are going. So I want to give attention this morning to this map to glory, as it were. It was already introduced this morning in terms of the ordo salutis, that is the order of salvation or application of salvation. Some have called it the applicatio salutis. And you this summer have, after Derek's sermon at the end of May on the very text that is central for us this morning, walked your way through what has been called the chain, the golden chain of salvation. The order salutis moving us from effectual calling to regeneration to faith and repentance, justification, definitive sanctification, adoption, progressive sanctification. The ultimate destination is this morning's topic of glorification. If I could have you envision this for a moment, that this golden chain is actually gloriously connected and becomes this morning, as it were, a glorious crown, a crown of glory that is ours as the children of God. Indeed, in God's word in Hebrews chapter two, we see that there's actually a pioneer one who is going before us. And what is this pioneer doing? 
the one who is described in Hebrews chapter 12 as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews chapter two and verse 10 tells us that he is leading many sons to glory. That is, he is leading the people of God to glory. This trailblazer, as Hebrews puts it, who has ascended into the heavenly places, as I could borrow the language of Star Trek, he has gone where no man has gone before. But guess what? He's taking you there too. The essence of salvation in terms of its destination is the crown of glory that we share with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So it is that particular feature this morning that is our focus. The book of Hebrews, as well as the book of Romans, lays out for us this map to glory, as it were. In Hebrews chapter, sorry, in Romans chapter 8, which is going to be our primary text this morning, starting in verse 18, the Apostle Paul lays out a map of history from creation to consummation. From the very beginning, the purpose of God for the people of God is laid out in the construct of beginning, middle, and end. And when we get to to, Romans, to Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, I want you to envision yourself at the trailhead. You're getting ready to hike a course and you see this description on a banner, you are here. But this is where you're going. And a map at a trailhead often doesn't only tell you how to get there, but if it's a detailed enough map, it will actually explain where the risk spots are. What are the challenges of this hike? This pilgrimage that you're on, what is the nature of it? And Paul in Romans 8 will tell us that we are dwelling right here and now in a world that is characterized by bondage to corruption to futility, to suffering. This is where you are. But dear ones, I remind you this morning, this is not where you're staying. That there is purpose on this map to be sure. In fact, Paul lays out in Romans 8 that God is fully in control. His design is personal purposeful and perfect. It's personal and, pers- personal and purposeful and perfect for the world. More particularly, it is personal, purposeful, and perfect for his people. And by clear way of implication, it is personal. It is purposeful and it is perfect for you. There is no fumble along the way. And those whom he has justified, he is also making us glorified in Christ. So what we have this morning in this map in Romans 8 is a map not by somebody who studied the landscape and discerned the path. We have the one who created the landscape and designed the path. And he leads us personally, purposefully, and perfectly along the way. Romans chapter 8. Familiar text, verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So wherein lies glorification? What is it? Well, put your seatbelt on, because we're going to find out. We're going to look at it in three different ways this morning. And the first of these breathtaking certainties is actually stated for us explicitly in two ways in this text. 
And the first is that in glorification, we are made like God through the power of Christ Jesus. We are conformed into his image. We find language like this throughout scripture. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 will describe of the transformation in a twinkling of an eye that will take place on that last day when we will, as John will put it, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. Imagine being not only declared righteous legally, but made fully pure, utterly cleansed, utterly without sin, utterly without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. You are fully transformed by and in the resurrected Christ. We will, as this text tells us, be conformed into his image, perfect, mature. We'll say more about that later. But I want to remind you that God brings about a complete transformation. He delivers a certain perfection. And by certain perfection, I mean it cannot not happen. That's not good grammar, but it's great theology. It cannot not happen. You will be transformed into the image of the glorious, resurrected, exalted Son of God, the very one in whom the Father is well pleased. You know what that means? That on that last day, the Father will look at you as his child and say, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. That's the stuff of glorification. F.B. Meyer in his commentary on Philippians as he's reflecting on that opening section in Philippians 1 that he who began a good work in you will perfect it on the day of Christ Jesus makes reference to the work of an artist who has just deceased. And you come into the artist's studio and you may find dozens of partially completed paintings Masterpieces, but not finished. And Meyer makes this comment, as we go into God's great workshop, we find nothing that bears the mark of haste or insufficiency of power to finish. And we are sure that the work which his grace has begun, the arm of his strength, will complete. God is perfectly committed to making you perfect. Did you notice in this text that the language of glorification is in the past tense? Did that make you scratch your head? I thought glorification was future. It is. Then why is it in the past tense, Paul? Why do you write of it in such a way that it's in the past tense? Well, note that in this whole section in Romans 8, 18 to the end of the chapter, at the centerpiece of it all is the person and work of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And your resurrection is so intimately tied to his that it is as good as done. Do you know that in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul argues about the veracity of the resurrection, You know how he does that? Go back and look at your Bibles this afternoon. We don't have time to go there. But verse 12 and following, he argues of the veracity of Christ's resurrection on the basis of yours. And yet Christ's resurrection is that which is causal of yours. But so tied to Christ's work is yours that they cannot be separated. So why is it in the past tense? Because Christ is already glorified. Therefore, you cannot but be glorified. That's the logic of Romans 8, 29 and 30. It is a certainty. The text will say that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Yes, 
that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Language of firstborn, don't misunderstand. What is in play here is that he is our elder brother. He is the exalted one. He is the preeminent one. But he does all of this, all of his work, all of his work on the cross, his suffering unto glory is to secure your suffering unto glory. He is the firstborn among many. The very reason Christ was glorified is so that you will be. Don't lose sight of that. Everything then that Christ has become in his resurrection, you will become in yours. You will be like God. You will in Christ be made like him. John Calvin, in his preface to the Geneva Bible, there was a 1535 edition and later a 1550 edition. I'm going to read a section for you from that that lays this out in just a verbally rich way. And I'm actually going to read it, but I'm also going to have you read it with me. Calvin writes this, And even any good that could be thought or desired is found in this Jesus Christ alone, for he humbled himself to exalt us. He made himself a slave to set us free. He became poor to enrich us. He was sold to redeem us, captive to deliver us, condemned to absolve us. He was made malediction for our benediction, oblation of sins for our justice. He was disfigured to refigure us. He died for our life in such a manner that by him harshness is softened, wrath appeased, darkness enlightened, iniquity justified, weakness is made strength, affliction is consoled, sin is impeached, despite is despised, dread is emboldened, debt is acquitted, labor is lightened, sorrow turned into joy, misfortune into fortune, difficulty is made easy, disorder made ordered, Division united, ignominy is ennobled, rebellion subjected, threat is threatened, ambushes are driven out, assaults assailed, striving is overpowered, combat is combated, war is warred, vengeance is avenged, torment tormented, damnation damned, abyss is thrown into the abyss, hell is held, death is dead, mortality, immortality. In short, mercy has swallowed up all misery and goodness all wretchedness. That's what Christ has done for you. Such glorification then cannot not happen. Secondly, not only are you made like God in Christ, you are further to dwell with God in Christ. I hope you've already begun to make some connections in your mind image of Christ exalted takes us all the way back to Genesis 1 where the design of God for humanity is that we would reflect him purely and perfectly and what does sin do it disfigures us so that our reflection of God is distorted and it is permanently so until the the rightly figured one takes we who are disfigured and turns us into righteous and holy sons and daughters. Thereby, we are now privileged to be in the presence of God. We are transformed, as I quoted earlier from 1 John, we see we are like him for we will see him as he is. One of the central themes of the entirety of Scripture is God's commitment to dwell with his people. It's what we call the Emmanuel principle. Who is Jesus? He is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means? I didn't hear you. Emmanuel means? God with us. Think about that. God has designed you and me to be with us. In glorification, that which was thwarted by sin, that which was prevented by your sin and sinfulness, is 
fully reversed, whereby in the power of Christ's resurrection, you were made to dwell with God. It's been a vision of the people of God from the very beginning of time. Think of Psalm 23. David looks to that day when I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 140, verse three, the upright dwell in your presence. Romans 8, 17. Just before the section that we've been addressing, listen to this. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now the latter half of this verse gives us the roadmap to glory. Your personal purposeful suffering is the God-ordained pathway for you to join with Christ so that you too may be glorified with him. That is the divine prescription, and it is purposeful. God does not fumble with his people. But don't miss this language. We are heirs of God. Let that sink in just for a minute. You know what that means? God is your inheritance. It's not a package of stuff. Yes, we celebrate the Ordo Salutis, all the benefits of our union with Christ. They are beautiful and they are glorious. But they are not to be viewed apart from the personal dimension of God's dwelling with us in and through his son, Jesus Christ. The one mediator between God and man. That Jesus Christ gives you access to the presence of God. Paul tells us that our inheritance is God. In and through Jesus Christ, we dwell with him because he comes to us. He is committed to Emmanuel because he is Emmanuel. By his own commitment, he will be with his people. Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. The famous commentator Thomas Haldane, and what is the inheritance and glory if it be not God? Who is all in all? Probably an unparalleled quotation here puts it most pointedly from Samuel Rutherford. Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without thee, it would be a hell. If I could be in hell and have thee still, it would be heaven to me, for thou art all the heaven I could want. The commitment of God to dwell with his people is an astounding reality of our glorification. Scripture puts this destiny in many ways for us. It speaks of our rest. It speaks of our peace with God. Oh, what blessed rest for our weary souls this morning. Having navigated under the headship of King Jesus, the treachery of our earthly existence, we enter in to the heavenlies in and through Christ. He renders perfect, permanent, and personal peace. He grants you full and fearless access to the one and only God. Glorification means that you and I will be tete a tete, face to face, coram Deo, before the face of God with no fear. For not only have we been made like Christ, but we are now in and through him granted access to the triune God. Blessed peace in his face and the fullness of fellowship with him that is beyond words to describe. There's a third piece here that I don't want you to miss. Back to Romans 8, 
You'll remember that in verse 29, it describes that golden chain that becomes that golden crown and glorification. And as if you were in the first service this morning, I, I preached about the forgiveness of sin. What an incredible thing that the God of heaven would forgive our sin. That in itself is mind-blowing. But there's so much more. Not only are we granted the forgiveness of sin, but as co-heirs of Christ, we become the royal family. And I don't mean that in a merely puny British sense. We become royalty in the very household of God. In the kingdom of God, you reign as sons and daughters. All of Romans 8 speaks of our adoption in and through Jesus Christ, whereby we become the sons of God. And all of creation is groaning. It's awaiting the final revelation of the sons of God. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But note that the familial language is directly tethered to glorification. You are glorified as a royal family. What this means is that you not you don't just enter into the kingdom of God as a mere pauper. Oh, would it not be enough as that wonderful Syrophoenician woman recognized that Jesus, Jesus, it is enough that I eat scraps. But we don't eat scraps. By the power and efficacy of Christ's work for us, we are made like God in Christ. We dwell with God in Christ. But guess what? We also are enthroned and reign. This is perhaps one of the most understated, yet most mind-blowing features of glorification. You are not just granted access into the kingdom of heaven. Paul will tell you in Ephesians chapter 2, having just described the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of Ephesians 1, in that stunning language where everything has been subjected under his feet. Then in chapter two, he says that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. That's true of you already. It will be true of you fully experientially on that last day. You not only come into God's presence, but you reign and rule with Christ Jesus. Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2, I don't have this text on the slide, but just listen to this language. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Now let me take your mind back to Genesis chapter 1. What were Adam and Eve commanded to do in the garden and then as they were fruitful and multiply and filled the earth, they were called to exercise dominion over all of the created world. And by their sin and yours and mine, dominion has escaped our grasp. God designed you to rule and reign the first Adam failed to do so. The last Adam not only rules and reigns, but brings his people with him to sit on the throne with him. In Christ, then, we rule and reign on that last day over a new heavens and a new earth, a, what I describe here as a groan-free universe. Why do I say that? Well, look at Romans 8, 21. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Don't miss this. Creation is writhing. All of the created order heaves and squirms in pain. And it is awaiting that last day. 
when you will have new bodies, you will dwell in the presence of God and the creation will be freed from the curse, freed from the corruption. Because in the freedom of the sons of God is the privilege of the world experiencing a righteous, holy, and loving rule by the people of God. Therein lies a breathtaking certainty of our glorification. In and through Christ, we are freed to reign and rule in the beauty and glory and splendor of Christ Jesus. Scripture gives us a map. It gives us a map to glory. Yes, there is the you are here now map that says you are in the middle of suffering and pain but it is a divinely purposed suffering and pain. And when Christ returns and calls all of his people back to himself, when we receive resurrected bodies, when we dwell with God in and through Christ by his spirit, we will also rule and reign with Christ over the new heavens and the new earth. So, royal son and royal daughter of the king. Let me remind you, yes, you are in a place of suffering, but where you are is not where you're staying. God has a glorious destiny. And that destiny cannot not happen. Those who are foreknown, they cannot be lost by the God who has lovingly known you from before the foundation of the world. Those who are predestined to conformity to you into the image of the Son of God, you will not remain unchanged. You will be transformed. Those who are called of this one and same God will not be forgotten. Those who are justified will not be declared guilty. And those who are glorified, I remind you, that in your justification you are made righteous, in your sanctification, under, I'm sorry, you are declared righteous in your justification. In your sanctification under glorification, you are made righteous. What is said of you is now true of you. That's where glorification takes you. That's the power of the cross. That's the power of the resurrected Son of God who in 1 Corinthians 15 is described as now as the resurrected one, life-giving spirit. He has given you new life and he will drop none of those who are his. One of the most phenomenal features of scripture. What does it call us to do? Even Hebrews tells us to fix our eyes on the pioneer and perfecter of faith. We are always called to look to God, look to Christ. We are called to look to him. But you know what we find when we see him for who he is and what he's up to? Guess what we find? While we are called to be Christocentric and theocentric, when we come to know the God who is, we discover that he is anthropocentric. He is completely committed to you, to his people. Isn't it interesting that as we become self-centered and turn on ourselves, we deny the very thing for which we were created. It is in the gospel that we are freed to discover that God has loved us from before the foundation of the world. And those whom he has foreknown He is predestined to conformity into the image of his son. And those same people he calls, those same people he justifies, and those same people he glorifies. You have a certain destiny. What Christ has procured by obedience, you and I receive by faith. 
So as we move towards our conclusion, I just want you to think with me about some of the implications of this. As royal sons and daughters, you are not just declared perfect in glorification, you will be made perfect. Indwelling sin will be given its final eviction notice. No longer will you be tested. No longer will you be tempted. No longer will your thoughts be cluttered by self. Your heart will be unburdened by shame. Your will uncorrupted by subterranean subterfuge. Your motives unmixed. Why? Because you will have the living water of Christ pouring through you. Your body, imagine this, permanently healthy and whole. You will know no pain, no suffering, no sickness, no deterioration. Your strength will be uncompromised. You will feel good because you are good. Your words will be only holy and constructive. Your deepest and purest impulse will be for the love of God and love of neighbor. Tears will be gone. Joy will be known without any qualification. All, all, all of your relationships at perfect peace, without any threat of misunderstanding, without any threat of conflict, without any chance of hurt. Oh, you will hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will find your soul fully satisfied. You will sing with pure joy. You will worship the triune God with mind and heart uncluttered by worldly cares. Your priorities and desires will be perfectly aligned with the will of God. You will delight in the good of your neighbor. You, dear ones, experience what Calvin describes, where death has died, hell is held. And the blessedness of peace is the very air that you breathe. Therein lies glorification. Let's close the closing of the book of Revelation. As the country singers put it, I've read the back of the book and I know that we win. And here's the language of glorification according to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. As he's reaching the culmination of revelation on the stage of human history. And he writes in Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5, these words, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. And he also said, hey, John, write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. So what on earth is God doing now? He is taking you from where you are to where you're going. And that destination is far more amazing than you could ever ask, imagine, or conceive. And yet God in his kindness has given us a little window. Yes, we will be like him. We will dwell with him. And we will reign before him a family of sons and daughters of the living God. And how do we know we're going to get there? Because Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is leading you to glory. Let's pray. These words are more than we can even begin to comprehend, oh God. But we thank you. Your grace is astounding. Your kindness unimaginable. And we thank you, O oh God, that you love us with an everlasting love and nothing can separate us from your love to us in Christ Jesus. So we cry out today, even so, 
Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.